Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our first monthly meeting of 2021 for Georgia ITE. I'm sure like many of y'all, I'm sad that we're not at Mary Max this year enjoying some nice fried chicken, getting to see each other and, and shake hands and hug and then be together. Um, you know, 2021, it's, it's starting kind of how 2020 ended for us, but we're hoping that as the year goes on, we get to get back together and get to enjoying each other's company and, and the friendship that really comes along with being part of this great organization. Um, before we get into today's uh, sponsors and speakers, I have a few announcements we'll go over. Um, the first is that winter workshop registration is open. Uh, that's right around the corner. Uh, George ITE and Ashley will be getting together again this year for a virtual format event that's scheduled for March 8th. So please, when you get a chance, if you're interested in attending, go online and look to register for that. Um, a second thing, that event that's actually starting tomorrow is the ITE Student Leadership Summit. That'll be virtual this year as well, and it'll have a larger um, company of students this year, as it will be international, so you'll get a chance to interact with students from all across the nation. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved uh, with either student chapter organizations or looking for future hires, it's a good opportunity to get involved. There's information posted on our website for that. Um, next is that Southern District ITE has a annual meeting call for technical papers. Um, if you're sitting around in your house looking for something to do, there is a cash prize for that. So the deadline to submit your papers will be March 1st, 2021. Um, so if you're, you're interested, there's topics online. You, you can see more information on our site as well. Uh, the technical committee, uh, they're getting ready to get kicked off for the year for Georgia ITE, and it's a, a big aspect of, of what we can provide our members. So uh, if there's something you're interested in hearing about or being a part of what's provided to our membership, uh, reach out to Joe Gillis. He's interested in, in finding more help and getting more input from our members. Um, and last is that we had a golf tournament scheduled for April of this year, but due to the you know current COVID circumstances still, we've unfortunately had to uh, cancel that one and it will be for the fall so we had that on the calendar so if you're ready to play golf don't worry it's still going to happen you're just going to have to wait a little longer um so beyond that please make sure to keep checking our e-blast christina barry our secretary treasurer this year is doing a great job of putting the information in there keeping it up to date uh, so if, if there's anything else you'd like to know about what we've got going on or coming up please make sure you know to, to read through that there's a lot of good good stuff going on to keep you in the loop so with the announcements out of the way, we'll go ahead and get started for today's meeting. Um, the sponsor for today is Southeastern Engineering, Inc. Uh, Teresa Apple will be speaking for them, and I will go ahead and hand it over to her. Thank you, Chris. Um, hello to everyone. Yes, I'm Teresa Eppel. I'm president of Southeastern Engineering, and we're very happy to be sponsoring this ITE meeting webinar. Um, it's an important topic for our state. And we appreciate the time to introduce uh, both myself and the company to uh, the IT members and attendees. Um, Southeastern Engineering is a multidiscipline civil engineering consulting firm headquartered in Marietta, Georgia. Um, we're also certified DBE with the state of Georgia as a WBE. And we also have a uh, and an office down in Serenby, which is in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia, as well as several project offices in the Atlanta, around the Atlanta area. Now, I'm a licensed professional engineer, and I started the company almost 25 years ago, um, providing traffic engineering services. And those services continue today under the leadership of, fine leadership of your esteemed president, Chris Maddox. Um, and over the last 20 years, we've grown from, from just that, just traffic engineering to about 100 people. Um, we've added several disciplines and it really expanded our core capabilities. Um, our management team, I guess we'll start with our civil engineering group. He's led, uh, led by Chad Apple, who leads the civil site design and the aviation divisions. Um, Scott Jordan, our transportation, uh, he leads our transportation group, our roadway division, uh, program management division, and as well as the CEI divisions. And uh, Greg Carl is our transportation survey lead. We also provide some support services 
uh, in environmental utility coordination and landscape architecture as well, just to name a few. So um, our robust group of, of managers and, and professionals and support staff allow us to serve our clients as a full service uh, consulting, engineering consulting firm. And um, we'll show a few uh, pictures of some of our most recent projects. But it also allows us to um, serve our clients as a strategic teaming partner and uh, providing the services that are best suited uh, for, the, for the pursuit, I guess, and also for um, just for success on the project and, and we fit where we were best needed. So um, uh, that is what our group uh, consists of. It basically sums it up. Again, um, we're very pleased to sponsor uh, this webinar and support ITE. And I appreciate the time to introduce myself and Southeastern Engineering to you. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Appreciate your time, your sponsorship. Um, it means a lot to help get the, the monthly meetings and things happen. You know, nothing happens without the help of our sponsors throughout the year. So we're very appreciative. Um, We'll go ahead and announce the, the speaker for today is Leo Beckman. He's the manager for governmental affairs for the Georgia Ports Authority. Um, Lee Beckman has been the manager of Georgia governmental affairs for Georgia Ports Authority since 2003. His responsibilities include managing governmental relations, coordinating uh, navigation projects with the Corps of Engineers and statewide outreach uh, for the GPA. Prior to joining the GPA, he served as the legislative assistant uh, to Congressman Jack Kingston, helping to secure funding for various projects such as Harbor Deepening in Savannah and Brunswick. Lee is a proud alumnus of Wake Forest University. Uh, he's a member of the Metro Savannah Rotary Club and graduate of both Leadership Southeast Georgia and Leadership Savannah. His other civic and community interests include serving as chairman of the Eppingham College and Career Academy, immediate past chair of Leadership Southeast Georgia, president of employability, as well as president of the Propeller Club of Savannah. And he also serves as the YMCA of Coastal Georgia Corporate Board. His presentation today will be about Georgia's deep water ports, growth and expansion efforts. So with that, Lee, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? We got you. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you for, for having me. Appreciate the time. Appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, I hope that this is, um, you know, educational for, for your membership and, you know, start some conversations amongst them about uh, opportunities that are going to be generated by the growth of the port. Um, and, um, Look forward to any any questions that they may they may have. Um, again, I've been with the Port Authority since 2003, so I've seen a lot of changes over the last almost 18 years, and um, it just seems to you know every every time because I, I was not a, a logistics professional prior to coming here, um, and it seems like every time that we can't get any larger, we find a way to get larger, and uh, the folks that we have here on our staff are just always doing a phenomenal job setting new records, creating new innovations and finding new ways to serve our customers better. Uh, so hopefully I'm able to, uh, to convey that to everybody uh, in this presentation today. Um, starting with our mission, I don't think it's really all that, um, you know, uh, crazy for folks to, to know what we do. Uh, you know, we empower businesses and entrepreneurs uh, existing industries, we attract new industries, uh, which further sustains communities, families um, through uh, international trade. And so uh, that's our, our goal. That's our mission. That's what we're charged with. And uh, that's that's what, you know, what we strive for every day. We have facilities uh, primarily on the coast of Georgia in, uh, in Savannah and in Brunswick, our two deep water ports. But we do have an inland port up in northwest Georgia. Uh, just north of Chatsworth in Murray County. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, recently, and uh, we received uh, the results of a study based on our fiscal 2019 uh, numbers, our throughput, which was uh, created for us by the uh, University of Georgia's Terry College of Business. 
Uh, you'll see the numbers here uh, showing that we generate about 500,000 jobs statewide. Um, you see the numbers in terms of total sales, state GDP impacts, personal income. We also generate uh, the business that flows through us generates about $6.1 billion annually in federal taxes. We move about 10% of the total United States containerized trade and about one out of every five job, um, boxes or, or containers that flow through the ports uh, on the East Coast come through the port of Savannah. The Garden City Terminal Savannah is the, uh, the largest uh, and busiest single container facility in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we've got about 1,345 acres inside our fence line here. Um, we, I always like to compare it to Hartsfield-Jackson. This is the Hartsfield-Jackson of container ports. Um, and other facilities throughout the nation uh, may, um, may be at larger ports like LA, Long Beach, and New York, um, but their totals at, at all of their combined facilities add up to more than just this one, but no other terminal in the United States moves even half as much as we move through this one facility. So it's a very impressive operation. Um, So our throughput in, uh, in Savannah has grown uh, considerably to, since 2001. Um, you'll see the numbers in the slide here. Um, and over the past year, obviously with COVID and the impacts on trade, uh, we have seen some, some fluctuations, particularly over the past uh, 12 months or so. Um, but we continued growing through uh, calendar year 2020. Um, which was a, a big deal because despite all of the, all the hurdles that we had to overcome in the past year, particularly uh, from March until July, uh, to be able to overcome those, those issues has, um, has been something unique to the Port of Savannah. Uh, over the past 20 or 15, 20 years, we have been the fastest growing port in the United States. Um, and even though we're the third largest gateway behind New York, New Jersey, and LA Long Beach, our 6.4% compounded annual growth rate uh, exceeds that of any other of the top 10 ports in the United States. Now, um, the important thing to, to check, and, on, and this is based on our fiscal year, uh, which ended in, in July uh, or ended in June, uh, Savannah saw less of a loss than the other top ports uh, on the East Coast. So, you know, New York, New Jersey lost 2.7%, Charleston lost 2.8%, Norfolk lost over 6%, as, as did Jacksonville. Savannah lost less than 1% due to the impacts on, uh, on COVID. So I understand y'all aren't seeing the slide changes. So let me, let me, let me reshare and see what's going on here. We'll re restart that and share. How about now? So the, uh, the, you see the declines here year over year through our fiscal year. Again, we were able to overcome that in the, uh, in the calendar year. Uh, but Savannah was, was impacted less than other ports and that's because of the diversity of our cargo and because of our continued efforts to in, innovate uh, in our facilities. Um, Again, you see our market share, one in five um, boxes, thank you, Chris, uh, are going through the Port of Savannah. Only New York, New Jersey moves, moves a higher percentage than Savannah. That cargo is coming to us from all over the world uh, and certainly serving the rest of the globe, but also serving the entire United States uh, internally. Savannah is the number one or most connected port in the United States. Um, actually the second most just behind uh, New York, New Jersey in terms of accessing uh, inland, inland areas uh, in the United States. We are the westernmost port on the East Coast. Uh, we serve 20% of the U.S. population, um, you know, in that, in that smaller circle that you'll see on the, uh, on the page, the larger circle represents about 45% uh, of the U.S. population. So, being westernmost port, our geography actually is, a, is an advantage for us. We're 100 miles closer to Atlanta than any other port in the nation. 
when you look at the population growth in the United States, the Southeast is the fastest growing quadrant in the United States. So I, I, you know, obviously our uh, geographic position is in the center of the Southeastern uh, coast. Um, and being again, Western most gives us uh, more direct access to that area, uh, which means that our market share will continue to grow. In the past year, we saw a sharp increase in the number of rail lifts that we moved. These are not uh, measured in 20 foot container units. These are measured in total lifts. So nearly 500,000 total rail lifts in fiscal year 2020. Um, we are, as you see in the slide here, currently expanding our, our rail operations. That is a little bit of a dated photo of our Mason Mega Rail facility, which when completely constructed, um, will give us a capacity of a million container lifts per year. Um, on the left, you'll see the Norfolk Southern operations and CSX will be on the, on the right eventually. Uh, the right side of that photo will look like the left side of the photo uh, when it's fully constructed. We're moving 3 million uh, contain or, or trucks, uh, truck transactions through our gates uh, every, every year, uh, where this was a fiscal year 20, uh, averaging 11,000 moves per day between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, we've had days where we've moved over 13,000 uh, trucks in and out of our facility in a single day. Um, Turn times for these drivers is very important. The quicker they can get in and out, the more turns they can make in the day and the more money they can take home to their family. At the same time for us, the more we can move in and out of our facility, the higher our capacity of our gates. And so being able to turn those trucks around is not only important for our port users, but it's also important for us and our customers. And so having a, a turnaround time of less than an hour for a two-way move or just over 30 minutes for a one-way move is, is very efficient and um, not too many of any other ports in the nation can, can brag at that, that rate of efficiency. When you look at our connectivity inland, uh, having two uh, interstates right outside of our, our gates is very important. Uh, we are six miles from I-16, less than six miles from I-95. And when you look at the roads leading to our facilities, you see our our access uh, continues to improve. We work very closely with the Georgia Department of Transportation to plan these roads, these last miles to give us better connectivity uh, to those interstates. Uh, quite often when I go around the state and um, talk about our access to these interstates, uh, you know, I might be in, in Northeast Georgia and they might say, why do I care about roads? In, in Southeast Georgia, why does that impact me? Well, you think about all the businesses that are moving cargo in or out of our facility and the last miles getting in and out of our facility uh, are, uh, if they're inefficient, then that hurts their supply chain. So the more efficient those last miles are, the more efficient the supply chain is for all of the businesses in our state and our nation that use our port here uh, via truck. So uh, the improvements here are, are of, a, of a statewide importance. Now, when you're looking at the growth of the port, um, we have a lot of distribution centers uh, in our area. And you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide how the construction of uh, those warehouses has taken a sharp increase in the past five years or so. It's continuing to, to go up. Uh, and on the, on the right-hand side of this slide, you see the rates of vacancy have, have gone down. And so despite the sharp increase in construction, we're, we're not able to, to grow that vacancy rate uh, because as new warehouses come online, they're being snatched up, they're being filled with customers. And so uh, we actually have the hottest uh, industrial real estate market in terms of percentage uh, growth and percentage vacancy in the nation. Uh, here in, in Savannah, and we don't expect that to can you know to stop anytime soon. So the demand is continuing to grow, uh, and that's that's a good sign for the future. Again, you'll see you know the the correlation between uh, our growth at the facilities here. It's just another way of looking at it, and the growth of of occupancy uh, at or near the port. As the demand continues to grow, so does um, you know the the industrial 
uh, rent or the rent for those um, facilities. And you'll see that Savannah is still below that of all the other major ports in the United States, uh, which again makes it a very uh, appealing market uh, for our customers and, and our potential customers. Now we are working on a harbor deepening. I'm sure most of you know that. We've been working on it since really in earnest since 1999. Um, Thankfully, the, uh, the deepening should be done later this, this calendar year, uh, hopefully uh, this calendar year, if not early next calendar year. We're very excited to see the dredging work completed. Uh, there are still a lot of other parts of this, this uh, project to, to be completed, um, but the deepening is the, is the one that brings the benefits to our state and nation. So we're very excited about that uh, and looking forward to seeing that, that done. Talked a little bit about the, uh, the mega rail facility, which you see pictured on this slide as well. We spent uh, about a billion dollars in the past 10 years um, on our facilities. Uh, we plan to spend over $3 billion on our facilities in the next 10 years. Now these funds are coming from within uh, our operations. They are not coming from uh, the state you know, uh, budget. It's separate from the state budget. Uh, we generate our funding through what we charge our customers, the shipping lines that are bringing this cargo. Uh, and that allows us to put that money back into our facility because we don't have a motive for profit as a state agency. And so that money helps pay for the salaries of our employees, helps pay for the maintenance and upkeep, as well as the expansion of our facilities. And so uh, we're very excited about that, but that's the, a lot of building, a lot of expansion uh, coming in the next 10 years. So one of the big projects that we're working on here is the straightening of berth one. Currently there's a little bit of a bend in the berth. By straightening that berth, we'll be able to accommodate longer and larger vessels, which will give us more capacity along our dock side. Um, so you'll see in 2023, when that is completed, we expect to have a capacity on our docks of six and a half million TEUs per year. TEU is a 20 foot container um, there are 20 foot containers, 40 foot containers, and 45 foot containers. We measure them in 20 foot equivalent units or TEUs. The, uh, the new rail that we're, that we're expanding on the mega rail facility, you'll see pictured here. Um, you'll have Norfolk Southern and CSX working side by side. Currently, Norfolk Southern is on the left hand side, the lower left hand side of this photo, and CSX is on the uh, right hand side underneath the number five. Um, by combining those two operations, we're also going to be able to take Norfolk Southern out of this neighborhood and reduce uh, some at grade crossings. It'll also allow all of the switching on our facility to happen on terminal rather than having it happen in the neighborhoods or over roads that are being used by trucks and commuters. Uh, so that'll improve the safety, it'll improve the livability of the local neighborhood, and it'll expand our capacity at the same time. Now, Currently, Norfolk and CSX are building five to 8,000 foot trains that are going from our facility to points like Atlanta and then going to other areas in the United States. Um, what this project will do, as you see it, uh, the video here, um, will give us the capacity on our terminal to build a 10,000 TEU vessel or 10,000 foot um, train that will go directly to Chicago uh, directly to Memphis, directly to Atlanta, of course, uh, St. Louis, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, et cetera. And again, it turns our facility from a 1 million TEU capacity or half a million lifts to a 2 million TEU capacity uh, over the year, over a single year. These are the markets that we plan to serve with this expanded capacity. And again, going straight from Savannah to these markets without having to stop in Atlanta, reduces impacts on the Atlanta rail yards and allows those rail yards to serve the Atlanta market primarily, so it improves their efficiency. Um, but at the same time, it gets us to these markets much more quickly. Uh, to be able to go from Savannah to Chicago in three days uh, helps us compete more, more um, competitively, help us be more competitive with West Coast Sports. Um, serving the eastern third of the United States. 
Again, this is just more on the on the rail, um, you know, capacity and our top markets for rail. And again, you'll see that 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 little arch uh, between Dallas and Chicago and Charlotte, um, you know, will be better served by by uh, Savannah uh, than than other ports. So uh, that kind of wraps everything up for us. But I think it's important that that everyone understands that. Port of Savannah is in a unique position um, compared to our peers. We have an operation here that is second to none in terms of efficiency. Our geography plays a big role in our ability to serve our customers and serve new uh, customers as well. Um, we have great relationships with our, our longshoremen, uh, with our federal agencies, the Customs and Border Protection, USDA, FDA, Fish and Wildlife, um, and, and the Coast Guard, of course, two class one rail lines directly on terminal is also very important because it allows us to, direct, to, to use rail at its, its most efficient capacity. Uh, you're able to load fully loaded boxes onto those trains as opposed to having leave, to leave the facility and putting uh, boxes that are not fully loaded on the trains. Uh, and so access to, to that is, is, is super important for our future growth and for us to serve the, the nation beyond our state borders. So with that, um, I appreciate y'all's time and um, look forward to any discussions or any questions that y'all may have. Thanks, Lee. I don't see anything coming across right now. I know we did have a little bit of an issue with the video uh, showing. I'm yeah. sure our, our, you know, our viewers would like to see that. So if you wouldn't mind trying to share your screen again one more time to go through it. We were seeing the uh, kind of a the broader slide overview instead of the, the single one. So you can see that now? So we can see, we see all of the presentation. It's not on the presentation mode yet. So. Okay, so it's not on the presentation mode yet? Correct. All right, let me try it again. Yeah, I know it can be tricky. Well, for some reason it's got me showing uh, how about now? We still have got the, the whole PowerPoint view there, not the presentation yet. No. It always works in the dry run, doesn't it? It always does. <laughs> let me let me restart it. I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna turn it off and restart my PowerPoint. So I mean, have y'all seen any uptick or downtick during the whole COVID year? Everything been business as usual or? It has been business unusual, uh, to be honest. Um, the, uh, the, the beginning of the year um, started off good. We were um, doing very well um, in January and February and on our way to a, uh, a record year. Um, and um, then we, uh, then we hit March and, and, you know, obviously the impacts uh, that that had on international trade, um, you know, was more of a, a, a you know, access to cargo. So it was a supply issue there was still demand here in the United States for retail goods, um, but um, we couldn't get them from wherever they were coming from. And we'll try and reshare this again. How's that? Let me know if you can see it. We've got the, the PowerPoint mode, not the presentation yet. Okay, we'll just, there, there we go. Here we go, we got it now. So, you know, supply was an issue really in, in the first couple of months, first few months of the shutdown. Um, and then when China reopened, we started to get a demand issue. People couldn't get to the stores to purchase what they needed. And, and so there was, it went from a supply issue to a demand issue. Uh, that was really kind of the, the second half of the shutdown or, or you know, all, you know, when we were starting to reopen um, before the supply chain really 
kind of changed and started to react to this this new this new problem. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers not being able to get toilet paper. Um, and part of that was because the toilet paper companies are built to supply half of the toilet paper to an office setting and half the toilet paper to, you know, a home set. Well, you know, they can't just up and change the type of toilet paper that they, that they create, um, you know, at a moment's notice. So, you know, there was a lot of shifts like that amongst the industry and, and figuring out how to serve that, that, that radically different demand took a little bit of time for the supply chain to figure out. Um, so that takes us through July. In August, um, we saw a record month. It was our busiest month ever. Things had started to reopen a little bit. Um, and a lot of businesses had allowed their, um, their supply to dwindle. So they had to, their stock to dwindle. So they had to restock everything. Plus, you had a, an increased demand because people were starting to go back to stores. September followed up. It was not it, did, it was not bigger than August, but it was our busiest September ever. Uh, October broke August record. November broke October's record. Um, December was the busiest December ever, and January, I believe, broke uh, November's record. Now it was very close. So, you know, the past five months, we've seen something close to 20% year over year growth every month. And so we went from March through July, seeing 10% declines to August through January, seeing as much as 20 to 25% increases. Uh, and so being able to overcome that in the calendar year to show an increase year over year um, was, was phenomenal. I have not seen what other ports have done, but I would I would venture to guess that many of them did not see a growth year over year. Um, and so we were very fortunate to be in that position to uh, to see that growth and that change. Here's the growth from the calendar year, uh, so you guys can see it. That was a very long answer to a short question. I apologize. Any other questions? We do have a few. Um, we'll go ahead and get to one that's kind of relevant to what we were just talking about. It's, um, you know, we've a little bit of how the Port of Savannah operated, but what about Brunswick? Similar to the operations there, or how, you know? Um, so Brunswick uh, did not see uh, year over year growth. Uh, and that's because they are um, so connected to the auto industry. And many of those auto plants shut down uh, completely. Uh, and auto sales declined as well. Uh, but in recent months, they've seen sharp increases year over year. Uh, so, so we are expecting to see a good year this year down in Brunswick. Um, but their market that they serve um, you know, was impacted differently than, than many of the retail and the agricultural markets that we serve here in Savannah. We're continuing to grow our facilities down there. We've got a lot of um, expansion efforts going on in Brunswick. Um, and we have, you know, um, just as much expectation out of them for growth in the future as we do here in Savannah. And then uh, one other question is, if there are any smart technologies in particular y'all are using at the port to evaluate ways to improve efficiency? As far as oh, certainly. Uh, improving efficiency is the name of the game. You can reduce the time it takes to turn a box. And you can reduce the cost it takes to return a box. And we can deliver that to our customers. Um, and that makes us more appealing than, than our peers. Um, we have a number of things that we've implemented at our gates and on our terminal. Everything, as you might imagine, is automated in terms of processing cargo as it drives in and out of the facility. Now, if an in-person truck driver will come and go, but we've given all of our, uh, of, of our local truck drivers who are coming in on a regular basis an RFID tag. So as that truck comes into our gate, the RFID reader reads the truck and populates all of the information that we have on that truck and what that truck's supposed to be delivering.
that day. And so when it gets to that first gate, um, we've got cameras that have optical character recognition that can read the container, read the, the chassis that the truck is driving in, and everything should marry. And as it marries, it gets to the scale, it weighs, if it weighs what it's supposed to weigh, the driver swipes the badge. You know, if everything you know marries up, it goes on to the next set of gates, which is manned by an in-person uh, clerk. Uh, and, and, that, and that clerk will check everything is, uh, again, second time, and they'll go into the facility. But as it goes into the facility, it tells our equipment, our IT equipment, that, hey, truck driver X is here. They're going to be in position Y, so you need to have your equipment there available and ready. And then when that box is picked up at position Y, it tells our other equipment, hey, truck driver X is going to position Z. You need to have equipment to be able to load that, that container as it's, on, as it's on its way out. Um, and so everything is automated in terms of allowing our people to know where they need to be, to be prepared for that truck, to get that truck in and out as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, there are other smart technologies that we have tested. Uh, one of those being a, a um, you know, with the, we worked on a pilot program with the Port of Shanghai. Um, there are seals on these boxes that customs needs to know that the box has not been manipulated or not been opened. And so we worked on a, uh, a while back on a um, pilot program with them to see if a smart seal would allow them to have more information to help reduce the need to, to you know, monitor that box through the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's, that's ended for, for a little while, but it did give them some more data. Uh, ultimately, you'd like, it, you'd like to know a lot of things about a box before you can say that it's completely secure and not in need of any, any monitoring from Customs and Border Protection or any other federal agency. Um, but the, the technology is not quite there yet. And once it gets there, there will be the question of who pays to implement. Uh, and so, um, but we are working on a number of other other things to improve uh, the efficiency through technology of our facilities. Um, and we're constantly uh, in talks with other ports on their best practices as well. Uh, we've had a, a few more come in. One is about the Talmadge Bridge and uh, any update on that needing to be either raised or the channel deepened to allow for larger cargo ships to access the facility. Uh, yes, so we um, have thrown the idea out there and are working with Georgia DOT to look at the potential of raising or putting in a newer, taller bridge. Uh, as, you, as you might imagine, when a ship comes into a facility, it has a depth and it has a height. And as we deepen the harbor, you can push that, that ship further into the water, which gives you more uh, uh, space on top on the air draft. But the ships currently are having to come in high, which means they're getting very close to the bottom of that bridge. So the deep end will push those same ships down, giving us that additional air draft. But as the ships get larger, the air draft goes away again. And so um, we anticipate that there will be larger ships that will be asking for uh, an air draft that, that we cannot currently accommodate uh, in the future. Uh, and so uh, that's why we're having those discussions with the state DOT uh, and other uh, other stakeholders to see what the potential would be to to build a new one or to replace the current one or to raise the current one. There's a number of things that they need to look at and factor in, uh, and what is the best decision for the state. So, um, so that discussion is being had, um, but it's not uh, anywhere close to uh, to a decision at this point. Then one other question is if, you know, people talk about Amazon kind of exploding during the pandemic and if their inclusion of their new delivery services have really changed the port's operations at all, or if, you know, if there's anything seen beyond your lines that reflect how well they're doing or if it's kind of. Sure, sure. You know, Amazon is, is picked on a lot um, for this, but it's not just Amazon. It's every big box retailer has had to, uh, assess and reassess their, their delivery of goods to their customers because no one's going to the stores these days or 
if they are going in the stores, they're not, they're, they're just parking out front and they're having to deliver, you know, hand deliver um, the widgets that they're purchasing. Um, certainly Amazon, since it doesn't have storefronts, is, is leading the pack with, with, with that innovation. Uh, but there are a lot of other retailers um, that are finding new ways to deliver their goods. Uh, one thing that we've seen and one thing that has delivered or delivered has grown uh, demand for our facility is the change from just-in-time delivery to just-in-case delivery. So more and more retailers are building up an inventory just in case someone wants it. Whereas before, um, you know, a big box retailer like Walmart or Lowe's or Target or Home Depot, they would know approximately how fast every article in their store would sell. And so as that last teddy bear was pulled off the shelf and scanned at the, at the register, uh, there'd be a truck at the back of the store delivering the next set of teddy bears for that, um, for that shelf. Um, now they're putting them in warehouses. They're never going to the shelves. They're just sitting in a warehouse so that they can be uh, driven to, or, or delivered to your house as opposed to going into the store itself. Uh, and so that's part of the reason we've seen this increase uh, in business is because they're, they're having to increase their inventories uh, here in the States rather than relying on the speed and the anticipated demand for every every article that we have. Uh, we had one question come in about the percentage of containers that leave via rail versus truck, you know, the total breakdown. So right now the, the general breakdown is 80% truck, 20% rail. Um, as the mega rail comes online, uh, as demand changes, we expect to see rail jump uh, to 25% in the next few years. Um, and, and that may that may grow even further. Um, but, uh, but currently, uh, the predominant delivery method is truck. Um, in terms of import and export last year, we were fairly balanced. I believe it was 51% import, 49% export. Um, which is also highly efficient uh, because you want as many coming in as they are going out so that you're not having to, you know, uh, bring in cargo on the import side and, and export empty boxes. You want to export loaded boxes. Um, and so that one-to-one -one exchange is important for the shipping lines because when they leave with empty boxes, they're not getting paid. When they're leaving with full boxes, they are. Um, uh, to compare that to Delta. Delta likes to fly into Savannah from Atlanta with every seat filled, but they like to fly from Savannah back to Atlanta also with every seat filled. And so that's that's important for our customers and it makes us more appealing as a, as a port to have that balance trip. Actually sets up good for the next question was if there's a, kind of any information on, there was the potential talk of Hartsville-Jackson moving into control of the Georgia Ports Authority and how that you know, potentially affect work y'all have going on. I don't know if you can speak on that. I haven't heard of Hartsfield Jackson taking over the Georgia Ports Authority. Uh, Hartsfield Jackson is a, a function of the city of Atlanta currently. Um, and, and so that would not be something I'm sure that our, our, our state, uh, whether our state leaders would want to see happen. Uh, I do know that Hartsfield Jackson has been looking at increasing uh, the amount of cargo, the air cargo that they move. Uh, and that certainly would be beneficial to our state. Uh, if you think about the types of things that you would move through a port versus the types of things you would move through an airport, uh, they're, they're two very different um, needs there. With your airport, a lot of times you're moving uh, more time sensitive things like flowers uh, or higher, uh, higher, more expensive things like electronics. So if you think about uh, a large employer in Georgia like Kia, Kia may move the, the parts for a vehicle that they're constructing in, in West Point, uh, but the radio may come in via air cargo uh, or a computer chip that goes in that car may go via air cargo. And so um, you marry those two capabilities between the heavier uh, stuff that we're moving here at the port and the lighter you know, more time sensitive stuff that might, be, might move for, through Hartsfield-Jackson and deliver them both to West Point, to Kia, 
to build those those vehicles that serve you know uh, our country as well as, as, as being exported through uh, the Port of Brunswick. Um, that uh, that makes great sense for them and and makes you know creates a lot of jobs for us here in the state. Well, at the minute, that's all the questions we've had. If you want to try to play through the video. Sure. You want me to do the video again? Yes. Okay. Let's see. So this video, again, is the uh, straightening of birth one. See how that works. Can you all see that okay? Yes. This will be married with the addition of, uh, of more ship to shore cranes, taller ship to shore cranes serving these larger uh, vessels. And there's one more video here. This is the Mason Mega Rail, and kind of an artist rendering of what it will look like after it's complete. A lot of this construction has already been done. both class ones, the CSX and Norfolk Southern on our facility, giving us the capacity to build longer unit trains uh, and moving them through the state onto their ultimate destination. Perfect. Those look great. I'm glad we got them in. Okay. Really well to see it. So um, I think with that, it didn't seem we have any additional questions coming in. So uh, I want to go ahead and thank you on behalf of the Georgia IT for taking your time uh, to present to us and to answer our questions uh, towards the I, end. Uh, I do apologize for the uh, the issues with the PowerPoint. I hope that everyone was able to get everything. Uh, if folks have additional questions afterwards, I'm happy to, if you want to send them to me, I'm happy to answer them or get them answered for, for y'all. I know you guys uh, do a lot of planning around the state. We we do appreciate the role that y'all play and uh, delivering um, you know finished products for our our transportation and logistics needs. Okay. Lee, thank you very much for your time today. Sure. Um, we'll go ahead and, and let you go free, and uh, we hope to be in touch soon. Yes, sir, I appreciate it.